Okay. Hello. I'm glad to be here, but I got I got to, I got to mention something that that before I came here, I actually got people writing to me and phoning me up and telling me I shouldn't come here. <laughs> Seriously, they 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 told me this is the armpit of the Bible Belt, <laughs> and I'd be in big trouble. But fortunately for you, I really hate mixed metaphors, so I decided to come anyway. Uh, and, and, and also, you know, I, I, I know from experience that you go to these places uh, where, where people have, have these preconceptions about the nature of the community and so forth, and you discover that they are full of enlightened, rational people too, just like most of you here, I'm sure. And that, that one of our jobs has to be to fan the flames of reason, and that's why we have to go to places like this when, when students invite us to come and talk. So I'm very glad to be here. Uh, the other thing I want to do is, you know, I, I have a little dilemma. Uh, I, I give a lot of talks, and I've got, I've got all kinds of talks sitting here on my laptop, and I'm trying to decide which of, two, of these two I should give to you. So maybe you can tell me. So, so one is kind of a tes personal testimony to atheism and why I'm an atheist and, and why I think it's, it's really a powerful tool. And the other one is a, a traditional cranky rant, rant against creationism and why education... <laughs> that's the one? Okay. Well, good, okay, that's what... Although I, I have to tell you that, that the other one is much, much better. But of course, you know, whichever one you picked, I would tell you that. <laughs> Give both. Yes, do we, do we have a few hours? For... Okay, so, so let me just talk a little bit about science education. And uh, Many of you know I'm, I'm a biologist and an educator. I teach at the University of Minnesota Morris. And uh, as a college educator, I run into this, this major problem all the time that students are coming into my classroom extremely poorly prepared. This is tragic because I get all these freshmen coming into my introductory biology course and they, they are confident that they're going to be going to medical school and uh, I, ha I have to break the news to them that maybe 5-10% maybe of the class will get into medical school, that most of them will drop out in the first year because the, the honest truth is that they have been poorly served by their high schools. The high schools have screwed them over and not giving them a good education, in particular in biology, which is kind of essential to doing medicine, uh, they're, they're getting crapped on. The, the students are coming through the high schools and they are not getting taught the basics. And the basics, of course, are evolutionary biology, right? That you've got to know that if you're going to be in biology. Uh, one of the things I have to do in my classroom then is I have to do a lot of remedial work, which means I slam them really hard on evolutionary biology just to bring them up to speed. Now, the problem, of course, is the one that's in that title right there. There's a war between science and religion. Richard Carrier just told you about this. They're in conflict. There are lots of people who will deny it, who will try to tell you that, no, they, that they get along just fine, they can be compatible, etc. cetera. Uh, and, and they're full of shit, basically. That it's not true. That uh, there, there is a serious conflict between science and religion, and it's going on everywhere, and it's being fought over the bodies of our children in this country. The bodies and minds of the kids of America are struggling with this. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to talk a little bit about this. I want to make it quite clear that I think there is, there is a war between science and religion, and I want, I want to sort of incite people to be activists towards fighting this and, and where the problem really really lies. But the first thing I have to mention is something that even if, even if there are Christians here in this auditorium or other such religious people who are offended by my, my t-shirt, um, I think you'll agree with me on, on one principle and if, and if you don't, I'm going to have to beat you up. Uh, and <laughs> This principle is very simple and it can be agreed, con agreed upon by people of all faiths and all non-faiths and that is that the science classroom has to remain a secular environment. That we can't have science classrooms where we advocate particular sectarian religions and I, I will even make this great sacrifice, I will say that we shouldn't be pushing atheism in the classroom as well. When my students are taking my classes, I am not taking time out to explain to them why they should disbelieve in God. Okay, that's, that's off limits. 
not because I think it's not true, but because I think there's just too much darn work to get done in the science classroom. We have so much to teach. So this is a general principle. Keep the science classrooms secular. Keep science classrooms focused on science. Teach them that. Now, as, as a card-carrying atheist with my own t-shirt, uh, I'm pretty confident that eventually that will lead to atheism, as, as Richard was just explaining, uh, that naturalism is a consequence of, of thinking like scientists, and I think we'll see an erosion of religion, uh, but it doesn't have to be direct. We don't, we don't have to beat it into their heads from the very beginning. So one of the things I advocate is just let's, let's just all get together. I will get together with you know, people like Ken Miller, who's a Catholic and a scientist. I will get together with lots of people in my community, and we'll say, okay, we'll, we'll have this little compromise. We don't pick on kids' religion in the classroom. We just do science. And usually we can get people to agree on this. Uh, in order to do this, we've got some, we've got some good stuff on our side. And uh, th this, is, this is my little plug. Uh, at lots of my talks I do this. I tell all, the entire audience that when you leave this room, I want you to go join one of these organizations. They're, they're really good organizations to be members of. Uh, they are a bulwark in uh, keeping classrooms secular. Uh, the first one out there is the National Center for Science Education. It's an amazing group headed by Eugenie Scott. Uh, they are the ones that are working very hard to keep creationism out of the classroom. Uh, they were an, an important source of information in the big Dover trial a couple of years ago. Uh, right now, you know, if, if, if you are a teacher, if you have a classroom, and you want to teach evolution, these are the people who will be helping you out. You can call them and ask them, what can I do when that crazy parent comes, comes learning in my classroom and rants that, uh, that I'm evil because I teach about human evolution? They'll have an answer for you. They'll help you out. Americans United for Separation of Church and State is another great organization. Uh, dedicated to this simple principle of keeping the classroom secular. And also, importantly, keeping government secular, which is another thing we, we like to enforce. Uh, and American Civil Liber Liberties Union, of course, is also working along the same lines. Uh, Americans United is headed by a reverend, the Reverend Barry Lynn. So, like I said, this is something where you don't have to be an atheist to support it. And so we encourage everybody to do this. Uh, NCSE is cheap. 30 bucks a year, you get a nice newsletter, a quarterly newsletter. It really helps support this kind of thing, and, and it's wonderful. Okay, so we've got these great organizations working. And here's the good news. If you look in the United States right now, this, the science classroom is fairly secure. That we're doing a really good job of defense. That these organizations, for instance, are right there to step up and bat away any creationists that try to get into the classroom. And if you look at our case law, if you look at the history of case law in the United States, it's amazing. It's just been defeat after defeat after defeat for the creationists. Uh, evolution is won every time. And we're keeping them out of the classroom. So these guys are the defense. They've been doing great. And they're, they're really holding the line. Uh, they're keeping the religious ideas out of the classroom. And so I, I have to leave you with that. That's an important message, that it's work, that work is working so far. However, there's always a however. When I tell you we're winning, you know, the next thing I'm going to tell you is, is that, in fact, we're actually losing in another sense. So we're maintaining this strict separation of church and state as far as the classroom goes. What's happening, unfortunately, is that outside the classroom, the idiots are screaming, and they're winning, and they're taking over. That the idiots, the people who believe in absurd nonsense, like that the Earth is 6,000 years old, are growing in number and growing in strength. How can that be, you might ask? Well, the, the problem is that we are so focused on defending the classroom that we are not a, doing a very good job of reaching out and advancing ideas outside the classroom. And seriously, a classroom is a place where students spend a few hours a day for a few years of their lives, and for the lar large part, they hate it, okay? They don't, they don't really care too much for it, where we demand work of them and, we, and we, don't, we don't reassure them as much as we should. And at the same time, they're going off to Sunday school and being told exactly the opposite and they're getting told the opposite by their parents. 
And seriously, if, you're, if your pastor or your parents tell you something, are you going to believe that boring, droning school teacher who says the opposite? And the answer for most people is no. They're going to, they're going to accept whatever the, the uh, religious beliefs are of the culture of the, of the time. And because we're so focused on defense, we're not getting out there and making a stink. At least we haven't been. You may have been noticed in the last few years, things have started to change a little bit with a few vocal people getting out there and uh, causing all kinds of annoyances and trouble. But still, I worry that we may have crossed a tipping point and we may not be able to recover because things have gotten really, really bad in this country. Uh, some of you may have seen this before. This was published in Science a while ago. Uh, Eugenie Scott, by the way, is one of the authors of this study. And uh, this is a ranking of nations by the knowledge of their populace of evolution. We're asking how many of the people in this country accept evolution as a legitimate fact, a reasonable fact of science. And the blue bars are the good ones. Okay, you want wide blue bars. Those are the people who agree. And if you look there at the top, look at, look at uh, Iceland. I want to move to Iceland. You know, that, look at those, that big blue bar. The red bar is the, is the percentage of, this, of the residents of Iceland who believe in creationism. And the yellow one is the percentage who are just kind of waffling and they're not really sure. And, and, and I, I actually have no problem with the wafflers, the, the ones in yellow, because science is actually something hard, and I think it's wonderful if you don't understand it. If you say, I don't understand it, I'm, I'm not going to commit myself one way or the other. So there's Iceland at the very top. Uh, you have to go browsing way down near the bottom of this particular graph to find the United States. There we are, second from the bottom. About half the people in this country accept evolution, about half accept creationism. This has been a uniform result of many polls all across this country for years and years. Half and half. It's terrible. I mean, half the people in this country believe in this very silly Bronze Age myth that the Earth was created in you know, 6,000 years ago by a deity in six days which is, it's, it's simply absurd, it's contradicted by all the science. Uh, but there they are, blithely going along with it. And, and the other tr troubling thing here is it, it, you know, like I said, the yellow bar is not so bad. They're, the red bar, those are people who are darn certain of it. They are really positive that this is the way the world was created. If you want some reassurance, we did beat Turkey. Turkey is even worse than the United States. Uh, and has got some real problems. Here's some of the sources of these problems. Uh, this is a, a, a little map that's illustrating science standards. Now, if any of you here are school teachers, you know about this. That most states, what they have is they have a, have a set of science standards. You, teachers don't just go into the classroom and randomly teach whatever pops off their heads, okay? It's, it's actually disciplined work where you have to have a, a, a lesson plan, you have a set of curricula that you are going to teach, you have goals for your classroom, then you have to get them through certain bits of knowledge in the course of, of your year while they're in your class. Uh, it, it is actually a very rigorous sort of thing. You have to work at this. And most states have these sets of science standards where they say in very general terms, you know, they, these aren't nitpicky little things that say day by day what you have to do, but they list a set of goals to be accomplished in the classroom for each year, for each subject. And you can find these things on the web, uh, all states have them, uh, that uh, you can look around and find them, and, and most of them have something where they talk about biology. And there are organizations that go around and rank these and ask, okay, how good are your science standards? And what you discover there is it's all color-coded. The orange states are the sucky states. Those are the states that either leave evolution out completely from the science standards or just have some utter nonsense, some poorly worded nonsense there uh, for, their, for their evolution standards. So you can see there's a lot of states there that, that aren't doing so well. Uh, the yellow states are the ones that are satisfactory. and, and uh, I've looked through the guidelines for defining whether a state is satisfactory, and basically it's whether the state is willing to use the E word in their science standards. 
They don't have to say anything very specific beyond that. So we've got a really low bar we're setting, and you're, you should be pleased there to see that Missouri has met that standard. Okay, they've jumped over that. They, have, they actually mentioned the E word in your science standards. Uh, and you also notice that uh, Minnesota, my state, uh, is about the same as yours. We're, we're actually revising our science standards this year and we're yelling at them very hard. We hope that ours will be much better and will become green like California, which has excellent science standards. But, you know, look at the little comments scattered around this graph. You know, uh, Illinois, an embarrassment. That's how bad theirs are. Uh, Wisconsin, the state right next to us, which we're pleased to see because we're kind of rivals with, with Wisconsin, uh, their science standards are confused on the subject of evolution. Uh, it's, it's all over the map here where we have very poor support. And, and this, is, this is a concern because, like I was just saying, the populace at large is messed up. They don't understand these. And what we need is science education that corrects misconceptions. And many states are just not doing the job. Now, I also have to qualify this a bit because we have these, these science standards on paper and smart, responsible science teachers will obey them. They know this is what we've got to do. Uh, but in my own state, we've been surveying our students that have been coming out. This is the work of Randy Moore at the University of Minnesota. And we've been asking, well did, well, did you get taught what you were supposed to get taught? And we give them little surveys and we're finding about half the students are coming out of high school never getting exposed to evolution. This isn't so good, okay, they're supposed to be taught this and they're not. And often what it is, is that teachers who are reluctant to teach evolution will do something clever, like they'll put it at the very end of the unit, of the semester, of the year that they're teaching. And uh, as we all know as teachers, schedules always slip and so usually the stuff at the end gets short shrift and may even get bumped off the schedule and evolution conveniently gets bumped out of many schedules. Now, you might say, why would a teacher do that? I mean, I, I take special pains to teach evolution in my classroom. Uh, well, one reason is this recent survey where they asked, okay, here's, here's a set of beliefs, all right, right, right up there on the top left. So do you believe that humans have developed over millions of years, God had no part in it? Do you believe that humans have developed over millions of years, but God was involved somewhere, you know, kind of the theistic evolutionist position. And then uh, God created human beings pretty much as they are 6,000 years ago or so. And uh, the blue is the public at large. And like I said, about half of them believe in creation of some sort. The red is our school teachers. Look at that, 16% of the high school teachers, the science teachers in this country are creationists. Do you really expect them to teach evolution well? I don't, they're, they're, they're gonna fudge it quite a bit. So this, this is a big problem, that teachers are getting worse. Actually, I should say, individual teachers are not getting worse. A lot of te I know a lot of teachers, and they're great people. But what it is is the standards have slipped so much that some really bad teachers are starting to slip in. And they are teaching your children. In my own town of Morris, Minnesota, we have, it's a small town, okay? So we, we have a grand total of two biology teachers in the high school. And one of them is a creationist. So. We're precisely at 50% in Morris, Minnesota. Uh, this is a science teacher who recently told her class that she thought evolution was just like a Harry Potter story. And she's a fundamentalist Christian. She has a really low opinion of Harry Potter, too. <laughs> okay, this is, this is one that's, that's scaring me a little bit now. Is that we're seeing more and more of this, of creationists working their way through graduate programs and uh, acquiring legitimate degrees in the sciences. Not because they love science, but because they want those credentials so that when they te teach to a flock of Christians, they can lie to them and say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a credentialed science, scientist, I have a PhD in biology, and I can tell you that the evolutionists are all lying. Uh, when actually what they're doing is lying. And there's been several examples recently. Uh, Marcus Ross of the University of Rhode Island, uh, recently graduated with a PhD in paleontology. He did his thesis work on uh, marine mosasaurs discussing their distribution 65 million years ago. He's a young earth creationist, okay? At the same time he was in graduate school writing a thesis where he was 
promoting this particular kind of idea, he was going to creationist conferences and promoting intelligent design and creationism. You know, we, we can't go back and ret retroactively remove his degree. That would be unethical. We can't do that. He legitimately earned it. But he is lying when he was taking his preliminary exams, when he was taking his final oral defense. He did not believe a single thing that he wrote in his thesis. Yet he was doing a good job of acting and getting up there and saying it out. Nathaniel Abraham is another case just recently. Uh, he tried to sue Woods Hole, uh, Woods Hole for... Uh, hiring him and then firing him. He was hired to uh, study the evolution of zebrafish. Yay, zebrafish. I work on zebrafish, by the way. They're, they're really interesting animals. And so he, he was hired to work in a lab that was uh, studying the molecular biology and the evolution of certain molecules in the zebrafish. And uh, he, a few weeks later, he went to his boss and he said, you know, I, I really can't do this work that you've assigned to me because I don't believe in evolution and I can't really do any research on evolution. And he was fired. Uh, he got very upset about this, duh, and, uh, and tried to sue Woods Hole. Uh, fortunately, the, the Massachusetts courts slapped him around pretty silly, and uh, he's, been, he's been shot down now. Uh, Marcus Ross, by the way, I should mention, is now working at Liberty University. This seems to be the, the, the sinkhole for these people as they end up at, at a place like Liberty, uh, where they really don't need to know any science at all. Jonathan Wells is a very sorry case. Um, if any of you read my blog, you know that I despise Jonathan Wells. He's kind of, I consider Jonathan Wells kind of the anti-PZ Myers. He's, he's a horrible person. Okay, Jonathan Wells, uh, Jonathan Wells got a PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. You may have heard of Berkeley. It's got, it's got a reputation, right? It's, it's a very good place to study biology. And uh, he, he went through there and he, uh, he wrote, he, he, was, he was like third author on one paper and somehow he got a PhD out of his lab, uh, which he has been touting heavily as his credentials for um, doing uh, all these, these hack jobs against evolution now. Uh, but he's also, he's also on record. He also wrote that he specifically went to this biology program because father asked him to, to do this to further his goal of destroying Darwinian evolution. Father, of course, was the Reverend Sun Mung, Young Moon. He's a Mooney. And he was, he's, he's actually admitted it, that, uh, that he was not in this because he loves biology or that he's, he's interested in evolution. It was solely for the purpose of going out there and uh, destroying, he thought, Darwinian evolution. I, I gave a talk like this at uh, University of California, Berkeley, this past summer, which is loads of fun. I got to wag my finger at them and tell them, you did a very bad thing here in, in letting this person graduate from your program. But again, of course, you cannot retroactively remove a degree uh, by their standards. He met it. And uh, what I've been telling a lot of faculty now is that if you've got a graduate program and you've got students in your biology graduate program, what you need to do is you need to assign work in their preliminary exams or their exams for candidacy in their defenses where they have to talk about evolution. And I'm sure many of them will be able to quite competently parrot back the party line on evolution, explain evolution to you quite well. Um, and you're not going to you're going to end up not flunking them. But the nice thing is, you'll have a paper record, so that next time they go up and they go to some creationist conference and they tell announce that the world is. 6,000 years old, uh, somebody in the audience can stand up and say, hey, but I, I got this document from their university that says they, they said that the world was you know, at least 65 million years old because they were talking about dinosaurs from 65 million. That would be a really handy thing in arguments of this sort. Okay, so worry. These people are coming up the system. They are actively working to subvert the system. And many of them are succeeding. Uh, we're, we're getting to this, this point. <laughs> You recognize those guys, right? <laughs> yeah, th this, is, this is common in the culture. Uh, those guys at the top left, I'm just curious, does anybody know who they are? Gablers, Gablers I heard that, yes. That, that's Mel and Norma Gabler. Uh, they're dead now, but they sure did some, some um, awful work in Texas. Uh, they ran a little organization in Texas that vetted school books. 
So anytime a school book was being screened for acceptance by the, by the Texas school system, uh, Mel and Norma Gabler would get to, get, it, get to it and they would write a report. And this report would judge the book entirely on its adherence to biblical principles. And scary as it may be, they were influential. They were extremely powerful. They were able to throw out lots and lots of textbooks just because they would be able to go and say, well, this book is just, this book is full of Darwinism. And uh, it, it's, it's evil. It will teach our children to have sex and all kinds of things like that. So let's, let's not have it. And uh, the uh, Texas legislature, which has been written up many times by Molly Ivins, and many of you may have heard of it, uh, usually caved in to the Gablers. And it was, uh, they, they afflicted and corrupted textbooks for years. And they, their influence is still being felt, despite the fact that they're dead. Uh, for, for example, uh, the most popular textbook in biology is Miller and Levine's biology book. Uh, if, if you've been through high school biology, you're familiar with it. It's probably the most common one that you'll find anywhere. Uh, it's a pretty good book, except you know, if you read it carefully, you'll discover that evolution has just been neutered in that book. It's just been cut to bits. It is not strong on evolution. And it's that way because of those people screening the textbooks. Now, the happy bald guy with the mustache, who knows who that is? Come on, you're closer to Texas than I am. That's, that's Don McLeroy. Uh, Don McLeroy is a dentist. He's a young earth creationist. He's, he's a very vocal and loud young earth creationist. Uh, and as a reward for his efforts in Texas, he was re recently appointed the head of the Texas School Board. This is the guy who's running the Board of Education in Texas. And he is a young earth creationist. Uh, they really are taking positions of power. This, this is one that we're, we're very concerned about because he's also going to be strongly influencing textbooks in Texas. And Texas is the second largest uh, market for textbooks in the country. So what Texas says is very influential to textbook publishers. Okay, what about the missing link over here on the right? Who knows who that is? <laughs> Ken Ham, yes, very good, okay. You're, you're doing okay on my test so far. Yeah, Ken Ham, uh, he, he's from Kentucky, well he is in Kentucky now, he's formerly, originally from Australia. Uh, he recently opened a $26 million creation science museum. Whoa, $26 million right there. I, you know, we could run my university for a couple of years on that kind of money. So uh, th this, is, this is big bucks. Uh, there was a story recently, I think it was in the Washington Post, uh, he's getting record crowds. He is doing bang up business with this horrible little abortion of a museum in Kentucky. <laughs> now, this, this is especially sad because, you know, biologists, uh, any biologists here know that museums are crucial repositories of information about biological diversity, that they're essential for the maintenance of our particular disciplines. Uh, and museums all over the country are in deep trouble. Museums all over the country are struggling to keep afloat, and it's partly because legislatures are saying, no, we don't need to give them money. They're, what are they doing? They're just keeping these dusty old files open, and, and we don't care about those, when they're actually the lifeblood of a lot of historical research. Uh, so they're, they're very essential. Lots of museums are going the, uh, the funhouse route, and you probably know this. If you've been to some of the more popular museums, uh, they, they tend to be pretty awful, at least at the front end. They've got all this... Oh, for example, recently one of the biggest exhibits was, was Star Wars at science museums. You know, Star Wars is a fictional story. I hate to break the news to you, but there are people who are actually promoting this in museums. And yet at the same time, uh, Ken Ham's horrible, horrible little museum is doing great business and drawing in hordes of people. Th this should have you worrying about the republic that uh, such a museum as that can, can be taking over. The Discovery Institute, everyone's heard of the Discovery Institute, I'm sure it's a little think tank up in Seattle. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of face time, it's, it, you hear a lot about it. Uh, it's actually small potatoes compared to Ken Ham. Um, most creationists are of the Ken Ham variety. Uh, the Discovery Institute is simply, uh, uh, it's a front. 
It's a place that specializes in providing a superficial veneer of scientific plausibility that's easily penetrated by anyone with any knowledge of science, but it's there to, to put up this facade in front of creationists. Uh, it's actually not doing so well right now because of things like the Dover trial where they, they intelligent design lost bad, and uh, I'm, I'm actually thinking I may have to sometime soon remove the Discovery Institute from my my litany of, of satanic prayers for doom because they're, they're, just, they're just going away. Uh, I, I don't think they're going to last more than 10 more years. Oh, and then that, that pretty lady down the bottom right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Are, are you as aghast as I am? It sort of sounds like it. I hear a few moans up there. Uh, you know, this, this, is, this is a Pentecostal nut. This is somebody who believes the earth is 10,000 years old or less, uh, who knows absolutely nothing, and they want to make her vice president of the United States. Why? What, what can she possibly bring but ignorance? To the office, and it's it's terrifying. There's still a chance you should get in. Get on the web, and you find all these people talking about President Palin and so forth, because they're just praying that John McCain will drop dead right after the inauguration. And uh, this this woman is is nuts and unqualified. No, we don't want her here. You betcha, PT. Yeah, <laughs> you're sure. Okay. So anyway, here's, here's all these problems. I've been telling you about all these horrible things that are going on. And then, you know, you've got to ask, well, what, what's the source of the problem? What's causing this difficulty in our great country? Why are people following creationism? Why are people following this lunacy? And, and you know what the answer is, right? Yeah. The problem is religion. That that people would not be believing in these absolutely absurd things in the face of all the contrary evidence against them without some powerful motivating force behind them and that motivating force of course is religious beliefs dogma tradition myths all this kind of stuff is poisoning the minds of people and turning them off from real science and rea reality okay well why are they in conflict? That's, that's a tough one. And like I said earlier, you'll find many scientists who don't see a problem, who, who argue that, it is, uh, uh, that you can be compatible between science and religion. And uh, I, I'm going to mention Ken Miller again. Uh, I, have to, I have to qualify a little bit because Ken Miller is a really smart guy, and he gives a great talk. He's, he's somebody, if he ever get, comes around here, you should go see him. He, he's marvelous. Uh, but he recently a book, wrote a book called Only a Theory, uh, which does a great job of dissecting creationist arguments, except for the fact that somehow in this entire book, he didn't mention a single word about religion, except to say that it's not religion's fault. When it, it clearly is that, that what we have is lots of creationists, they're all religious. You do not find atheist creationists, right? There's a pretty strong positive correlation here. Now, of course, that's not to say that all religious people believe in creationism. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying that if you're a creationist, you're religious. Let's, let's not beat around the bush there. So there's something about religion there that's leading people down the wrong path. And what I would argue is that the reason it's so popular is, is, is first of all, tradition that we all revere the traditions of our ancestors. You know, I, I put up a Christmas tree every year. I don't believe in Jesus, but I think it's a nice, nice thing to do, right? Holidays are fun, the kids love presents. Okay, Christmas trees. And then I think a lot of religion persists because it's got those deep associations with our history, with our families, with our past, and we don't want to throw that away. Of course, the other re reason that religion is doing so well is uh, fear. Religion is all about fear. It's all about telling you you're going to hell if you don't follow us. And uh, people believe this. And, and most of the deeply religious people I know are also the most fearful people I know who are trembling in terror at the prospect of death. Whereas when you talk to most atheists who've got the most fear because, because we're just going to rot and turn into worm food, you know? Most atheists seem to be much braver and bolder about facing death, at least in my experience. And then another reason that religion is so popular, and I think, I think that ultimately this is probably the evolutionary reason 
that religion has thrived is tribalism, that uh, religion is a great tool for promoting co cohesiveness. Uh, it's, you know, you're, you're telling people to be afraid, but at the same time you're telling them, well, if you join together with your brothers and sisters and beat your friends over the, the, the enemy over the head with a club, you will go to heaven. And it's, so it's a great way to build strong tribes, strong, violent, aggressive tribes that will expand at the expense of other people. So that may be one reason it's done so well. But now, why are religion, science, in conflict? I feel, I feel a little superfluous saying this right now because Richard really pegged this. He described it in great detail. Uh, so I'm going to be really brief here, fortunately, for you. Um, why are religion, and science, in conflict? Well, one way is that, that they're competing ways of knowing. Which doctors hate competition, right? And yet here's science, here's things like medicine that is doing such a phenomenal job of actually keeping people alive. The population is booming because infant mortality is down so low, because we've got things like vaccinations that prevent infectious diseases, because if you get other problems, if you're, if you're seriously injured, if you, you know, people used to die if you, get, if you got a pinprick and got, and got infected. That just doesn't happen very often anymore, where, where it was routine once upon a time. It used to be that women died in childbirth routinely. During certain periods of, of, of English history, for instance, particularly because doctors had very dirty hands, uh, roughly 30% of the women were dying in hospitals of childbed, childbed fever. That's gone. Okay, we've, we've cured most of that, and that's, that's competition for prayer. It works very, very well. And I would say that uh, it, it competes with science, from, religion competes with science from my point of view, because if a student comes in and tells me that his answer on the test is correct because God told him it was so during the exam, I will flunk his ass. Okay. <laughs> it's just not the way it works. Okay, here's another important one. And, and Richard also talked about this, uh, that, that religion is epistemically empty and unverifiable. Um, my first day in, in introductory biology, you know, these, these happy little freshmen come in, you know, all the ones I just told you are thinking they're going to be doctors. And I, tr I try to help them out. I try to tell them, here's some hints for making it through the next four years and graduating with success. And, and one of the tips I give them is a way to look really smart in any classroom, in any science classroom. And that is one simple question. Anytime the professor raises his hand and says something you don't understand, don't, don't say, hey, doctor, I don't understand. Instead, raise your hand and says, say, how do you know that? How do you know that is such a powerful question in science. It's really the heart of science is constantly asking this question. How do we know this? How do we understand this? You know, that whole epistemology thing. Uh, and I, I tell the students that it's great because you, know, you can be completely ignorant. You could be completely lost in the class, and you raise your hand, you ask the professor, how do you know that? And he would be so impressed with how clever you are. <laughs> Especially if it's a good question where he can then sit down and spend 10 minutes explaining the experiments behind the, the particular question you have, which leads to deeper understanding on the part of the, uh, the students, makes the professor look really smart. Everybody's happy. It's a wonderful <laughs> question. Um, try asking that in church some morning. Well, for one thing, you know, the pastor usually doesn't like it when, when his parishioners raise their hands in the middle of the sermon and, and say things like, how the heck do you know that I'm going to hell? You know, because then they have to sit down and, 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 and break the flow of their, of their poetry and uh, explain basically that they're full of shit and they don't know really, but <laughs> Jesus said so, and that's, that's good enough for them. Okay, so that, that's important. For, for scientists, when scientists are looking for things to, to grasp, to understand, uh, we look for an epistemological basis for a particular belief. And religion doesn't have it. It really doesn't, except for this authoritarian, believe it because my book says so, or believe it because I say that Jesus said so, or believe it because a dream told me that it was so. Okay, but the, the really big one, the big Number one reason that religion and science in conflict are in conflict is this one. And <laughs> seriously, have, have, have you read any of those holy books out there? 
I, I, I've read a bunch of them. You know, the people keep telling me that the secrets of the universe are in the Holy Bible or the Koran or whatever. And I, I open them with great enthusiasm and I'm always tragically disappointed that they're, <laughs> these stories are absurd. I mean, get a, get a Christian talking about the depth of their faith and uh, the important things that their faith teaches them. And that you'll hear things about the Trinity, for instance. Can anyone here explain the Trinity to me? Any good Christians? I've never met one who could. The Trinity is absurd, right? We're supposed to have one God, but he's got, he's got three elements uh, somehow. That there, there is God the Father, there's his, his Son, which already is starting to get really wacky. And then there's this thing called the Holy Ghost, which nobody can explain what the Holy Ghost is. <laughs> Where does he come into play in the mythology? What was he doing? I, I, I don't know. But anyway, so it's, it's this, this compounded ridiculousness. And in Christianity, we've got this idea of original sin, that somehow you go into church and the guy is going to tell you that you are by default going to hell because of something your great, 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 many times great grandmother did. And what she did is she ate some fruit, okay, when God told her not to. And, you know, God is kind of a petty pissant in a lot of ways when he's doing this. Thing. And, and for some reason, this has damned me. You know, if, if, if God came down and told me that I'm not supposed to eat from this tree, and he was almighty and horrible and huge and, and powerful and throwing lightning bolts and things like that, and he said, don't eat from this tree, I would not eat from the tree, right? <laughs> I can say that. I, I would not commit that sin. So, why am I getting blamed for this? Although, to be honest, you know, if God told me that you can't eat from this tree because it will make you really smart and sexy, I might still be tempted. But still, I've got a good reason, right? And as Richard just explained to us, uh, it's all about what you want and what's really important, and so I, th I think I could make a good moral case for eating from the tree. So, religion is ridiculous. It's, it's just ridiculous through, and, and, and I have not met a single religion yet that is not anything but silly when you get right down to it. That includes Scientology, okay? It, you, can't, you can't name a rational religion to me. And I'm sorry, Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster? You're silly too. But I, I think you're proud of that. Uh, Okay, so, so why does it do so well? And, and I've got this little cartoon I have to show you that explains it all. This is, this is a simple cartoon explaining the conflict between science and religion. I think it's a powerful illustration of, of both our problems and, and what's been going on. So you've got to imagine two guys sitting on a rock having a conversation, and the topic comes up to profound philosophical Ill issues like, you know, where did we come from? That's a really good question. Religious people ask it, scientific people ask it, where do we come from? We want to know that. And I think it's a very human thing to be concerned about this particular issue. And, uh, you know, nowadays, if you ask a scientist, if you ask somebody like me, I will stand up there and I will give you my explanation. <laughs> and my explanation will be long and detailed. You, you, can, you, can, okay, you can praise whatever deity, deity you have that I did not give one of my science talks here because I, I do give lots of science talks. I didn't give you that choice. But you could be hearing about all kinds of nifty molecules. Uh, well, anyway, you give, them, you give them the details, which explains, you know, molecules, uh, going into cells, cells becoming more complex, giving rise to multicellular life, that we've got this nice fossil record that illustrates that, you know, these aquatic organisms acquiring amphibious traits, moving out of the land, uh, land creatures evolving through reptiles to mammal-like reptiles to reptile-like mammals to full mammals to various classes of mammalia to things like primates that led to us. And you know, really, it, it does, it, I admit, it, it does sound a little bit silly. It's counterintuitive. I can understand why people might initially reject it, but at the same time, you know, I, I could be giving this little lecture and, and at every point, the guy on the other rock could be asking, how do you know that? I would be encouraging him, ask me, how do I know that? And I would be able to explain the experiments and the observations that support this. So, as is typically the case when I, when I give these kinds of explanations, uh, the guy on the other rock is going to sit there with a stunned look on his face. Uh, this look of incredulity, he's just not going to accept this. And uh, then they will, of course, 
tell me their explanation. And their explanation is so simple and so elegant. Uh, you know, magic man in the sky. And my explanation is, I, I, I admit it, it's counterintuitive. It's Darwinian logic is ruthless and scary and pitiless. And it, it often puts people off, but it's, it's just reality. Uh, but this one, this, was, this is very intuitive. This is how we think of things. When we think of creating things, we think of agency. We think of people doing things. So let's just make a big man in the sky who's got this power to create people. And so, of course, he just, he just creates people. Zap, right? <laughs> now, of course, you know, at this point, I would be interrupting and saying, how do you know that? And he wouldn't have an answer. But we'll just gloss over that right now. You know, magic lightning bolt from the sky, whatever, it creates people. This feels good to them. And uh, the nice thing about this <laughs> is, is this person can sit there, and now he can talk to this magic man in the sky. And he can say things to the magic man in the sky, like, like, good job, okay, I'm, I'm really happy. What are these bits down here? What are they for? And all these other fun things. And he can, say, and he can also make demands. And he can say, okay, uh, could it stop raining? I'm, I'm getting cold. And he could also say, you know, here's another explanation for Christian. I really want something. I want something really bad. And, uh, of course, the deity will create it for him. Just poof. Now, of course, they don't, the God deity does not do this now. You know, I, I could not ask for a beautiful woman to appear here on the stage, and it would magically appear, although any one of you beautiful women out there could rush up to the stage. <laughs> it wouldn't happen now, but this is a historical explanation. He's saying this happened once upon a time. And, uh, you know, they're happy. This is a, you know, two people together, they're all happy, they're all, all created, they are feeling darn good because the most powerful creature in the universe, you know, the magic man in the sky, cares so much about them. They don't have a speck of evidence for this, but it does feel good. And to many people, feels good is sufficient evidence. Um, now, you know, of course, my reaction is uh, usually stunned at first and followed by laughter and smirking and, <laughs> and uh, you know, making fun, a lightning bolt, ha, huh? yeah, right. You know, because they, they, they can never ask my, answer my how do you know questions. Uh, but of course, there's always the last refuge of people in this position is, you know, they can always get a big rock and, and take care of me. <laughs> and to add insult to in injury, after they do this heinous, heinous act, uh, they can talk to God who will tell them what a good job they've done. So it's, it's this constant feel-good feedback where they don't have to challenge their, their, their minds at all, they just have to come up with these great ideas. And uh, it, it causes problems everywhere. Feel good is not evidence. Keep trying to tell people that. Uh, squeamishness is not evidence against something. Maybe you don't like being evolved from monkeys. Maybe you just dislike monkeys intensely. But it's not reason to disbelieve it. You need the facts and the evidence. Okay, so then, of course, the big question is, uh, what are we going to do about it? Well, this is, this is a room full of atheists, right? Most, a lot of you, at least. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. Talk about it. Talk about it. Oh, you're boring. <laughs> you may be the only person on this campus that's ever said that. <laughs> big rocks. Big rocks. <laughs> Now that's an interesting idea, you know, tit for tat, but you know, we're, we're committed to rationalism and, and I actually like, I like JT's evidence, a answer better than yours. So he gets a C, but you get an F, sorry. So yeah, talking, you know, this rational sort of thing, uh, you know, we, we do have to engage them, but I, th I think we also have to engage them in, in more ways than simply talking to them, that we have to act. We have to get loud, and we have to get obnoxious. We have to wake people up, and we have to motivate them. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of examples from my, my own life, my own recent life. Uh, here, here's one that you may have heard of. So some of, you, some of you may have seen this movie, and if you paid for it, I'm mad at you. <laughs> but I'll forgive you. It, it seemed to get a lot of press, a lot of PR. I, I contributed to it. Um, and, but it was, it was a perfect example of, of part of my philosophy here, is uh, when this movie was first coming out, 
Uh, this was a movie that was built on lies. Okay, they lied to get their interviews. They they hacked up interviews. It, it's just an all around awful movie. And uh, a lot of people who were telling me that the proper approach to this is silence. Let's starve them. Let's not give them the attention they want. Um, this has been a common approach when dealing with creationists in general, is let's not debate them, let's not argue with them, let's just turn our backs and pretend they don't exist. It doesn't work. Okay, it, it hasn't worked. The creationists are just spreading everywhere. Uh, and no, I said what we need to do is we need, we need to uh, stamp our little feet and yell and make a lot of noise and we have to expose these people for the frauds and liars that they are. We can't just sit back and wait for who knows what to happen. Um, fortunately, the NCSE came, went along with me. I managed to talk them into it. They have a, a site there called expelledexposed.com. You should go there. It, it reviews all the lies in the movie. And uh, as you know, there were a whole bunch of things that happened at the time this movie came out, like me getting expelled from the screening and so forth which was great. Seriously, that was the best result we could have gotten. Because my whole goal there was, you know, I, what I wanted was to expose these people as not living up to their own principles. And so by taking action, being obnoxious, and getting out there, and, you know, this was not my intent necessarily, but boy was I pleased when it happened, getting thrown out of a theater when I'm just quietly standing in line, was just perfect for illustrating this particular point. Then also, uh, some of you may have heard that, that afterwards uh, they had a big, uh, well, they, they said it was going to be a press conference where they would take questions from the press and so forth about the movie in general. Uh, it was really a, a setup jo job where they were not going to have anybody asking questions. They were just going to have their people standing up and talking, and they had this big phone interview thing, and I called in to join in, listen to them 10 minutes before the interview started, and uh, I heard them speaking about how we're going to get Ben Stein in on the conference call, and they happened to mention the conference call code. <laughs> now, what would you do in such a situation if you were a very honest, principled sort of person? Well, like me, you would immediately hang up, call back up, and use the conference call code, right? <laughs> so that's, that's what I did. I broke into their, their press conference. It was great fun. I, I politely sat there and let them spew their lies for about half an hour. And, and then I said, okay, all you reporters out there, this is PZ Myers. I was in the movie. I've got the true facts on this. Here's my phone number. Here's my email address. Write to me, and I'll tell you about the truth behind Expel, uh, which was so wonderful. You could, just, you could just hear the expelled people falling over backwards in their chairs and uh, expressing great shock at all this sort of horrible thing. But anyway, that, that's what I'm saying, is, is don't be afraid to get out there and get your hands dirty. Get out there and act. Don't just, don't just talk. I mean, talking is great. You've got you to gotta have a rational basis for what you do. But at the same time, you have to get out there and do things. You have to make a difference. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit of this video. Oh, maybe I'm not. Let me, let me. I just realized I don't have sound here. Well, okay, I'll just tell you. I've got a little clip from the movie. This is the only part of the movie I've seen. Uh, and it's the part where I spell out what I think will happen to evolution. Or, uh, excuse me, to religion, uh, where what I think uh, religion's fate will be, and it's, again, it's much like what Richard Carrier was saying, is that I think it's going to erode away that, that science is going to replace religion as a moral principle, as a principle for living. Uh, and in this little interview, I, I, I made this absolutely appalling analogy, which I have gotten so much hate mail about. Uh, if you've seen the movie, you know what the analogy is. I compare religion to knitting. And I say, this is what we want. We want religion to be just like knitting, a hobby that people participate in, that people can enjoy just for the sake of doing knitting or craft work. And, uh, but that, that isn't essential for living, that we don't judge people by whether they're knitters or not. And apparently, when this was shown in the theater, people was just were shocked. They were aghast. There were gasps of horror throughout the theater from some of the people I heard, which surprised. I thought it was being so nice. Well, anyway.
But then I got so much hate mail, but most of this hate mail was from knitters who, <laughs> who were really pissed at me for comparing such a dignified and useful and productive hobby as knitting to something like religion. <laughs> so I, I've been struggling, just in case there's another interview, I need, I need a new analogy. And at first I, I came up, well, okay, what about, what if I compare it to bowling? Oh, I heard a groan, all, yeah, I knew that. And the thing is, bowlers don't have the little sharp knitting needles, but they tend to be burly and bigger than I am, so I, I decided not that one. So I have a new analogy that I, I like to use, and this is, this is what I want religion to become. I want religion to become like masturbation. You see... <laughs> not quite, not quite. You see, the, the thing is that... that Masturbation is, is, you can make an argument that it's good for you, right? It's got some health benefits. There's nothing wrong with masturbation. I'm a good liberal. I think it's fine for people to go off and masturbate. Uh, it's, it's, got some, it's got some potential health benefits. Uh, it can be fun. Okay, people have fun with this. Uh, it, can, it can be practice for other behaviors. It's, so there, there's no objection there. However, of course, you know, the, the, the difference is in why religion is not yet like masturbation is that in general, people don't masturbate in public. <laughs> this is something we, we, we would like to change about religion. And also, uh, your expertise in masturbation usually isn't con considered qualification for the vice president. <laughs> so. But... But someday, someday, I mean, it, it, it really reflects my attitude correctly because I'm not out to destroy religion or ban religion, uh, just like I, I would think it would be absurd to go out and say you're going to destroy masturbation. Uh, we just, we just want to have you know, some, some nice cultural taboos wrapped around it to put it in its appropriate place where it doesn't disturb other people who are trying to get things done. Okay. Now, the other thing I've got to mention is, is that you need to get assertive. You know, this, this is a nice little cartoon here that uh, it, it's a very typical situation. Here's this, this guy just saying, okay, well, you're going to have a prayer, so I'm going to leave the room. And they will be treated as militant. You know, I'm always shocked that I am regarded as a ferocious, aggressive, militant atheist. And yet, look at me, I'm, I'm, I'm this boring, dry, academic, um, kind of teddy bear-like, as everybody tells me to my great embarrassment. Uh, and, and this is just a general problem, is that you know, most of the atheists here, you know what you're like. You're not out there burning down churches. You're not out there stamping you know, symbols on people's foreheads. You're not out there asking to disenfranchise people because they're Christians. Uh, the, even the most militant atheist here is, you know, like JT is like, Let's talk. See what I mean? It, it's just so wimpy and mild, relatively speaking. And, and it's good. It's, it's, that's okay. You know, we don't want a reputation for burning down churches. We would condemn burning down churches. Okay? But the thing is, you might as well be hung for a sheep as a lamb, right? So what you need to do is be more aggressive. Uh, you've, got, you've got to come out more. Feel free to go ahead and admit to everyone that you are an atheist. Uh, you know, the, the most common objection I hear from people is, well, you know, when I get together with family over Thanksgiving dinner, I don't want to cause trouble. I don't want to cause strife. I don't want to you know, promote disagreement among family members. And I say, screw that. <laughs> There's nothing better over Thanksgiving dinner than a good shouting match. I mean, it's, Go ahead. Don't be afraid to come out to your family. You anyway, know, I hear people say things like, well, my, my grandmother, is, she's so old and frail, and she cares so much about her faith, and she, she believes deeply, and I don't want to annoy her when she's so close to death. And I say, go out there. Go ahead. Get in a fight with Grandma, please. <laughs> you know, the thing is, this is the best place to do it because Grandma loves you, right? And what will happen is she will learn that you have beliefs that are different from hers 
You will have conversations about this. Sometimes there'll be angry conversations. Sometimes there'll be weepy conversations. But through it all, she will love you still, and you will still love her. And hopefully what, what you will both gain out of it is an appreciation for each other's position that says, people can hold different beliefs about religion and still care about each other. This is, what you're, this is the lesson your grandmother has to learn. If you're, if you're constantly sheltering Grandma and Uncle Fred at the Thanksgiving dinner table, uh, they're going to go on being obnoxious, bigoted jerks for the rest of their life, and uh, they will never have that enlightenment of seeing that smart people, good people, don't have to believe in their precise beliefs. Uh, so, so come out, you know, if, if you've followed Richard Dawkins' site, you know about the Out campaign. You don't have to go to the Richard Dawkins' site and do this stuff, but you, you should. Stop being shy about telling people. You know, get this T-shirt or something. <laughs> get something subtle, like the little red A pin. Something, anything. Put a bumper sticker on your car. Just make it known to the world out there that you guys are driving around the same streets that they are, are going to the same pharmacies that they go to, are going to the same movies, are out there in the world with them. And teach them that they have to get along. Okay, another thing to do is just question stuff. Um, this was, this was, I thought this was a great campaign. This was, this was an uh, atheist group in Ohio that put up this sign. Actually, they modified it a little bit. So they put up a sign in their student union that says, asks the question, did Jesus Christ have a homosexual relationship? What a wonderful question to ask. Now, I'm, seriously, we don't have any evidence, right? There's no evidence he had a homosexual relationship, but there's no evidence that he was heterosexual either, right? He was 33 years old when he died. Do people really think that he never felt a single lustful thought, thought to another individual? He was hanging out with prostitutes. Come on. He had to have some little... ...reality of Jesus Christ. What kind of human being was he, really? But it's also making a point that you know, homosexuality, well, it's not bad. These, these are not people who thought that they were damning Jesus by calling him a, a fag or something. They were thinking this was a fine thing. Of course, the, the reaction was, was spectacular. All the people wandering around were uh, very upset that this group would actually question something about Jesus. That They would say, oh, well, but Jesus has all these statements in the Bible where he damns homosexuals and he's against homosexuality. Uh, and that's another good opportunity to ask, how do you know, and dare them to pull out their Bible and find the verses where Jesus says anything against homosexuals, and they will be, they will be stumped for a good long while. You can send them off for a few weeks to read through their Bible, and they won't find it there. Uh, but lots of people saw this, and they, the sign only lasted for a day, unfortunately, before they had to pull it down uh, by, the, by the administration. But just putting it up there, asking these hard questions, causing a little sensationalism, getting in the school paper, getting in the, in the city paper. It's good. It helps. Uh, the other thing I tell everybody to do is go ahead and blaspheme. <laughs> God damn it all to hell. Yes. <laughs> do it. Uh, blasphemy is a victimless, victimless crime. It doesn't hurt anybody. But it shakes people up. So many of you have heard of Blasphemy Challenge on YouTube. Uh, this, was, this was started by Brian Fleming who has a, a movie, movie out called The God Who Wasn't There, which you should take a look at if you want. It's, it's, it's a good movie. And uh, he, he just makes this point that somewhere in the Bible, there's a verse that says the one unforgivable sin is to deny the Holy Spirit. I've already mentioned the Holy Spirit. Who knows what the Holy Spirit is? But they are saying, okay, if you deny the Holy Spirit, you're going to go to hell. There's nothing you can do. You're, you're damned for all time. So he was telling everybody, yeah, go out there and deny the Holy Spirit. And people did. Thousands of people did on YouTube. There are lots of videos on YouTube of him damning the Holy Spirit. So I say, go for it. This is another good thing to do. Uh, there's, there's apparently another blasphemy challenge that is started up on YouTube that I started unintentionally. <laughs> but I think it's pretty cool. Uh, it all started here. Well, Many of you may have heard of the case of Webster Cook and Benjamin Pollard at UCF, University of Central Florida. Uh, uh, Webster Cook is an interesting guy to talk to. He's, he's, not, he's not one of us, exactly. He's not exactly a fervent atheist. So he's, he's, he's more of a libertarian. 
And those of you who read my blog may know what I think of libertarians. It's, it's not pretty. But, okay, we get along anyway. He's a libertarian, and what he's very concerned about is waste in student government. And he discovered that the Catholic Church was holding masses in the student union using student fees to pay for the services. And so he went to this, this mass, and he took a cracker, and he didn't swallow it. Yeah, you know, really, really daring here. And went back to his bench and was going to walk out with it. And uh, some of the people noticed that he was doing this. And they just blew up and they grabbed him. They fought with him. They tried to get it away from him. He finally escaped. And uh, Bill Donahue of the Catholic League got furious and posted this fatwa on his site uh, where he said he wanted this student you know, expelled. He wanted the student arrested and jailed for violating the Catholic sacrament. And uh, again, if you read my blog, you know how I react to this sort of thing. So I, I said, well, OK. <laughs> Somebody score me some crackers. I'll show you blasphemy. I won't, I won't hesitate to do that. And fortunately, I've got tenure. So you know, nobody's going to fire me. Uh, so uh, I also made a few rude statements in there. And, you know, seriously, I, I said, okay, I would not return their Eucharist even if the, if the choice was that they would, they would offer to have Bill Dunn who kicked the Pope in the balls because I think that would be an inhumane thing, right? That's, that's not a good thing to do. I would consider that a, a terrible thing to do. I don't want people doing that. I don't want violence. But I don't, cons I don't consider a cracker to be necessarily that, that dangerous. And so I said I, I, would, I would abuse it and photograph it, throw it on the web. And, uh, of course... Bill Donahue got really mad at this. <laughs> and, you know, it's hard to believe he would say things like this. It's, it's, it's hard to think of anything more vile than to intentionally desecrate the body of Christ. Come on, use your imaginations. Can you think of anything more vile? <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of a few things right now. I'm not going to say them. But yeah, I can think of lots of things that are much more vile than desecrating a cracker. So Bill Don, he was saying this, and he's saying, yeah, we, we want the University of Minnesota to fire P.Z. Myers. They were sending letters to the president of my university, to the chancellor of my university, and saying, fire this guy. He's, he's evil. And uh, then, of course, this, this one, this one, I thought, he actually got a member of, of uh, the Republican committee to agree to increase security at the Republican National Convention for fear of me. Okay. Yes. You know, the Republican Convention was held in St. Paul, which was in my backyard. That is, it's, it's 150 miles away, but I have a very large backyard. Uh, the, my backyard is almost as big as my balls were after hearing this. I, I was... My wife can tell you, I was insufferable for a few days. <laughs> I was so proud of myself here that I, I had actually driven the Republicans to increase security at the convention. Because I don't, I don't know what I could have done. You know, I could have gone there and eaten a cracker in front of them or something. Anyway. So, yes, and, and it, was getting, it was getting more and more ridiculous. He has got a whole bunch of press releases damning P.Z. Myers. Uh, this one I thought was really funny. He said, okay, now he's, he's, got a, he's writing the Board of Regents too, and they're saying, you've got to, you've got to fire me. The guy do something about me. And, and that last line at the bottom there, that's when I really like. Moreover, we are also contacting Muslim groups nationwide. One of the common themes in the letters I was getting is, you're only picking on the Catholics because we wouldn't chop your heads off like the Muslims would. If, the, if you did something to the Muslims, Boy, they would do horrible things to you. So, of course, what, they, what the Catholics have got to do is alert the Muslims. <laughs> you know, th th this, this is rank cowardice. They're, they're going to get the Muslims to do their dirty work against me. Okay, well, of course, you know, I, I read this stuff, and uh, I, I did take action. I, I, did some, I did some research, and I discovered some horrible things. Sacrament de desecration it has a long history. It's been around for a long, long time. Um, in, uh, the first case was in, in 1243. So we're talking, you know, 
almost 800 years, 750 years ago, where people started doing this. This is where the Catholic Church first issued a document saying that the sacrament was holy, that it couldn't be taken away from the church, that you couldn't defile it, that this was a mortal sin to do this sort of thing. And then along the way, also happened to apply, did you know that all those Jews out there really want to steal our crackers and do magic with them? <laughs> are, are there any Jewish people here today? There's not a single Jew in Springfield, Missouri. Okay. Have, have you been lusting after crackers? Do Jewish people use these things in your rites? No. You know, it's, it's, it's just the height of absurdity. You know this. Everyone here knows this. That, that The Jewish people have their own religion, their own beliefs, and their beliefs are not centered around some other wacky religion's bizarre interpretations of their dogma. The Jews don't give a damn about crackers. They don't think there is any power in them at all. They don't believe in Jesus even, okay? Can we get this straight in our heads? Yet here's the Catholic Church saying that, they, that the Jews are all out there lusting for our crackers. And you can find all these medieval woodcuts of, of these portrayals of all these, you know, like all Jews are, they all, they've all got the huge hook noses and they're all going around with their little hunchbacks and their crackers, pounding nails into them, which would then cause them to bleed Jesus' blood, which then they could use in various unholy rites in their churches, which sounds absolutely ridiculous to us now, doesn't it? <laughs> to most of us, at least. Yet it was serious business. In 1243, people read this stuff, and what did they do? They went out to the local Jewish enclave, and they murdered everyone, men, women, and children over a myth and a rumor of host desecration, they murdered people by the thousands. And it wasn't just quick murderous deaths, you know, shoot them through the heart. It was tie them to stakes and set them on fire. It was torture them slowly and kill them with great glee, all because of this particular myth. Now, the Catholic Church has gotten better, okay? They don't do that anymore. The, the last person killed for host desecration was in the 19th century. So it's been about 100 years since they stopped murdering people over the belief that they would desecrate a cracker. And now instead all they do is uh, call for their expulsion, their firing, and uh, ask the Muslims to go out and do the job for them. <laughs> so they, 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 there is a distinct improvement in the Catholic Church since, but not quite enough. So anyway, yeah, I, I did it. I, I desecrated the cracker. Uh, I, since, since there were all those pictures of Jews shoving rusty nails through them, yeah, I said, okay, well, that's, that's apparently the tradition. So let's, let's impale it on a nail. Uh, it's hard to see. It's that little circle right there in the center. That's, that's a communion wafer. Uh, it was sent to me by a fellow in England. So that cracker has actually taken a long transatlantic journey to get to me. Uh, I used it because the guy actually did a YouTube video where he had himself taped as he was going up and getting the, the consecrated cracker in communion at a very well-known Catholic church in London. And he sent it to me and he wrote this nice letter and he said, you know, I really want you to do this because we need to protest the actions of the Catholic Church. That he was particularly incensed about what the Catholic Church has been doing in Africa. That Catholic policies in Africa have been devastating. Catholic Church opposes family planning. This is horrible for an overpopulated region. Uh, they oppose the distribution of condoms, which would be a great first step in preventing the spread of, of AIDS. But the Catholic Church says no. So he's saying, you know, I want you to do this for this reason. This, this is another horrible act. So yeah, the, the Catholic Church is no longer burning people at the stake. Instead, we're asking them to be fired. And we're also asking them to die slow, horrible deaths of, of AIDS. Okay, so I put this up there, and as you might expect, my email was... It's still kind of amazing. It's still trickling in. Uh, I've received something like 18,000 mails of protest. Uh, my president and the chancellor of my university have received equivalent quantities of actual physical mail, which I think is pretty cool. They hate me right now, but they've gotten these piles of protest mails demanding that I get fired. And oh, there was all this mail telling me that they, they had written to care, you know, the uh, Islamic group and saying, get out there and take care of this guy. 
Um, I got letters like this one, which I thought was just perfect. Uh, your act is far more deplorable than Hitler's Holocaust or the terrorists on 9 11. Wow. Yeah. I am really powerful, right? <laughs> this is over a cracker. Somebody brought crackers today, right? Where are they? Are you going to share? Yes. Okay, talk to this guy afterwards. And if you want a, a little bit of this juju, if you want to be as powerful as I am, as powerful as Hitler, eat a cracker. That, that's our context. Okay, well, so anyway, I'm just saying that this, this was a great motivator. That this, this has gotten me a lot of attention, and not all of it good, of course, but still, I think it's the kind of thing we need to do to open up more awareness. We need to, we need to make people aware of the fact that atheists are not just namby pe mamby people who will go along with whatever you say. We are people who will actively sta stand up and say, that is a load of bullshit. We're not afraid to tell you that that is nonsense. That's really the purpose of what I was doing, is to make people aware of the absurdity of these religious beliefs. And I think it worked for some people. It didn't seem to work for a lot of Catholics. We'll have to think of other strategies. Maybe somebody here is going to think of the next great thing that will set Bill Donahue on fire, I hope. <laughs> Okay, but let me close with, with one comment, and uh, this, this is a thoughtful comment that I've, I've gotten from people, and uh, it's, it's not just this one person, but lots of people have told me this, uh, and they say, you know, what you're doing is, is, is pretty loud, and it can be pretty obnoxious, and it makes people unhappy and annoyed, and are you actually harming our attempts to teach evolution? Are you going to be interfering with this because people are going to be so upset at the anti-religion message that they will, out of sheer spite, decide that they believe in a 6,000-year-old Earth. Uh, this, is, this is a little thing you can find on the web from Lawrence Krauss, uh, where he's, he's making the same point. He's arguing with Richard Dawkins, who also gets the same kind of stuff. I, I don't know why. I mean, obviously, the expelled incident shows that I'm much scarier than Richard Dawkins. But okay, Richard Dawkins gets a lot of attention for some reason about this sort of thing. Anyway, so Lawrence Krauss says, you know, this, this part in boldface, I wonder which is more important, uh, using the contrast between science and religion to teach about science or trying to teach or trying to put religion in its place. And, uh, you know, he, the thing is, he, he goes on, he says more about this, and he says, this is a good question. It's a, it's a sensible question. And I, I have a very simple answer to that. And the answer is, why not do both? We can do both. You know, if, if, if people can get up there and they can say, well, I can believe in both Christianity and atheism, why can't I get up there and say, I believe in atheism, and I think we ought to promote atheism, but I also believe in evolution, and I think we ought to teach that. There's no conflict there, none at all. Uh, I think what we have to do is we have to think long term. That in the short term, we need to keep the classroom secular, and strategies like those promoted by the NCSC and Americans United are great for that. They keep the, the classroom clean of sectarian influence. But I think we also need to think in the long term. We've been neglecting the long term. We've been letting the culture run wild and let these absurd beliefs percolate through the culture to the point where now we're electing presidents on the basis of whether they believe in God or not. And to do that, we have to be offensive. We have to get out there and be obnoxious to some degree, and that we aren't doing the, a, a good job of promoting science in the long run if we fail to highlight the fact that religion is ridiculous. Okay, I went in too long there. I'll stop. I think we're going to have questions next. So the flying spaghetti monster is silly. <laughs> and I actually think like, weak might be the nicest thing anyone on this campus has ever called me. 